Okay, so uh, let me start the last lecture. So first of all, I wanted to remind you uh, the key, some key things, so it's key uh, features of uh, modulus space we're talking about. Uh, it's modulus space PGS. And so uh, it corresponds to the created surface S, which you see here, with red marked points being given by the red arrows and uh, punctures uh, uh, here. And so there are I wanted to stress the following data. That first of all, we have discrete symmetries. And so this means that uh, there is a group, discrete group, gamma Gs, which is given by the automorphism group of G cross uh, mapping class group of S, uh, semi-direct product with the product of the veil groups and product of the braid groups, braid groups over components and veil groups over the punctures. And uh, it takes by cluster Poisson transformations on the space. Secondly, the second feature of this space is that it has a center. And so the center is given uh, uh, via projection of the space to a torus. So the name for this torus we call it AGS, but it is defined as a product over punctures of Z Cartan group and product over boundary uh, components again uh, Z Cartan groups, but now uh, coinvariance of this, uh, uh, Cartan groups coinvariance by the action of W0, kind of reduced version of the Cartan group. And so center, as I said, is given via this projection. And the last uh, piece of data, and the one I'm going to talk to right now, is that for each Uh, special point, uh, we have uh, potentials. So who are those potentials? Uh, so special point S, then we have mm, uh, uh, this potentials, uh, so this is a function WSI which is just regular functions on the space to A1. And I belongs to the set of positive simple roots, meaning the set of vertices of the Dengen diagram. And also uh, there is a map Rosa Bess. This is the data which you see at the special point. Potentials and projections to Cartan. So as you see, there are many Cartan's projection to Cartan's floating around here. So basically every puncher gives projection to Cartan, every special point gives projection to Cartan, and using uh, the special points we can combine those projections and get projections to Cartan related to the boundary component. Okay, now the main question now, who are those potentials? So the potential functions. Uh, it's a, uh, the following construction. So we use it uh, with uh, uh, Shane uh, in a paper about to zero thirteen, where these potentials uh, played a role in state statements like mirror symmetry, but now they will play an entirely different role and will live on slightly different spaces. So it's very mysterious to me why these two subjects go together. But okay, let me give a definition. So you have uh, three flags. You have B1 and B2 is the usual flags, and A is a decorated flag. And so now we consider the modular space of triples of these flags denoted this way. And so this is just A cross B cross B divided by the action of the group G. And so uh, it's consist, it's, it's a subset. Uh, because uh, it consists of triples uh, of this data, A, B1, and B2, 
such that uh, the pairs A, B1 and A, B2 are generic. And uh, so this is just space of triples. And uh, now uh, we want to define a function uh, omega i, which going from the space to a1. So how we define this function? So we notice that uh, uh, there exists unique uh, element of the maximal unipotent group which comes uh, into the definition uh, of A, this decorated flag. I remind you that this A is defined as a pa uh, pair, a unipotent group and additive character, no, uh, which is not degenerate. So the model space of such data, maximal unipotent group and additive character to A1 is, is the principal affine space for the adjoint group. Now I claim that there exists element of this particular unipotent group, which comes to the definition of this A, uh, such that uh, the first, so you have here two pairs, AB1 and AB2. And so this U sub A just moves them. This means that if you take uh, AB2, and this is U sub A multiplied by AB1. This just means pairs, not modulus action of the group. This parenthesis means you just consider pair. A, B2, it gives you some G torsor uh, because they're in generic position. And therefore, there is this unit U sub A which moves them because A stays the same here. But now uh, we get this U sub A, uh, but also mm, this little U sub A. You know, don't uh, confuse it with this, with this data. But now the flag also gives you the character. And so you can just define this wi on this triple a, b1, and b2 to be the value of this character on this element we just defined. So you get a function. Okay, so that's a kind of building block of the construction, but not exactly uh, what we are doing. Can you explain the that in the context of SLNR? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can explain this for, 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 for PGL2. It's not SL. I emphasize it's not SL, it's PG. And so it makes story different. So, huh? What's the I simple root? I, I is a simple uh, root. And how does the I enter the right hand side? Uh, it doesn't enter yet. Oh. So, sorry, actually, you're completely right that I should. Uh, Wait a second. So, uh, so so far, so far no. Mm. Uh. So so, sorry. What what I said is not exactly right. So so sorry for for little confusion. So this psi. The definition didn't end yet. This psi is canonically uh, written as a sum of psi alpha i's. Because, for example, if you have upper triangular matrix that has values like a1, a2, and something else, it's unipotent matrix, for example, then uh, there are two characters taking this element and this element. And taking non-degenerate character means that we take linear combination of them. And so when you set character here, I have to specify, and so thank you, Joel, for uh, uh, the question, so I have to specify uh, which of the components of this decomposition you take. So here I belong to the set I, okay? So what I said before is also good, but this is not what we need right now. This is also a, a good thing, some of them, but that's not what we need in this definition. Okay, before I go uh, and answer Francois's question, so let me actually give you the general uh, definition that shows how it works, and then... Mm, uh, we will proceed with example. So now suppose that you have some boundary component. On the boundary component, 
we have one special point and maybe some other special points, maybe many of them. And so among those, there are the most left and most right to the one S uh, we picked. But remember that when we pick a special point, we have two pinnings, meaning that we have two decorated flags sitting here. So this flag uh, can be called A minus, and this, uh, and this can be called A plus. And so they relate to this point S. Because when you define the pinning, so you're supposed to put two flags here and give the date of the pinning. But we are not going to use uh, any other decorated flags. We are going to use the flags uh, B and B prime, uh, which you see to the first to the left and first to the right uh, flags. Now we get the data because now we have the left flag here, A, and then we have B, and we have uh, my prime disappeared, and then we have B prime. And so now I can apply to this data uh, our construction and get the function. So by definition, this W S relates to the special point S uh, and uh, positive root alpha I is the value of this partial potential W I, which we just defined, on the flags A minus relate to S and then B and B prime. This is the definition. Now to Francois's question, so what is the example? Uh, so example, if you take PGL2, I stress not SL2, PGL2, then we want to define a potential function on the triples. Uh, the first one uh, is a, a representative for a decorated flag, which is a pair given by a vector and uh, area form. And the second two are the flags, which in this case just lines. And so we need to define the number which corresponds to this data. Who can tell me what happens with the razor? It's fell. Oh, that's not bad. No. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, and so I remind you that here you have the action of gm by t, and then here it acts by t minus square, and so we have to take uh, invariance with respect to this action, and so the cosets called this way. Now, what is the number? The number is omega of L1, L2 divided by this omega of V L1 multiplied by omega of V L2. So you notice that it does not depend on the choices of vectors here, non-zero vectors L1, L2, because they enter uh, numerator and denominator ones. But it uh, does depend on the choice of omega and V, but it depends in such a way that on this uh, orbits of the group GM is still constant. So it's a well-defined function. Okay, so we got potentials. Now, what do we do with potentials? So, mm, some question? So we go to the next thing we do, uh, we go uh, to the topic which is called quantum potential functions. and quantum groups. So I wanted to emphasize that at each puncture, and so mm, you see this puncture on this picture, you have two kind of functions. You have uh, the potentials WSI, but you also have projection to Cartan. This is data, the, the bottom data on the right. And so, therefore, mm, what you can do, so this is a map from PGS to A1, but we also have a map rho sub s from PGS to the Cartan group. And so we can form the function alpha i, uh, sorry, rho s upper star of alpha i, where alpha is a character representing the positive root alpha i. So we have two kind of functions. So we have R functions uh, which are potentials, and another are functions which are actually characters of the Cartan. And uh, this is the data which we assign to a special point. 
And so now comes the theorem. Mm. That uh, given a puncture, uh, sorry, given a special point S, uh, we have the following that first of all, uh, the functions uh, W, S, I, and uh, rho s star of alpha i have canonical lifts to the uh, quantum uh, to the, uh, algebra. So it's very important these lifts are canonical. Uh, canonical lifts to elements uh, which we're going to denote W S I and also by the same uh, rho S alpha I. And so they live in this uh, algebra, Q deformed algebra of functions, O Q P G S, and then W N invariance taking at all punctures. Now, this kind of uh, sp space of functions with taking W invariance, also we agreed to call it O Q of log. Uh, GS. It's just a definition. Okay, so first of all, we have these elements. Secondly, mm, let me go here. Uh, these elements. What? N is the number of the punctures. Good question. So these elements, which I denote by star, mm, give rise to uh, injective map. Mm, let's call it kappa sub s as a special point from the quantum universal enveloping algebra of uh, the Borel algebra uh, to or Q of this log GS. And so let me stop here for a second. So you see you have at every special point we have uh, now R plus R functions and so it's a very natural question to ask what these functions generate if you take the Poisson brackets or even better can we leave them to quantum uh, algebra functions and if we do what kind of relations they specify. So the part 8 one tells you that you can leave them this is the most important thing. And secondly, then, after you prove that you can leave them, it's not uh, that hard to prove that you have this in, in injective embedding, that they generate your Q of B. Now, how this embedding works? There are some generators of the uh, quantum group, uh, which are obtained by rescaling of the standard ones of Drinfeld and Jimba, and I will define them in a second, rescaling. And so this EI go to uh, WSI, and KI go to rho s star of alpha i. And so again, it's quite natural from the picture because this ki's, they give you the Cartan. And we do have projection to Cartan uh, assigned to this special point. This is our data we were talking about here. And so this Cartan proceeds to the quantum group. And the potentials give you this ei's. And now the third part of the theorem is that for any uh, boundary component, a pi with uh, two special points, exactly two. Uh, you can still ask uh, the question, what does this UB of Q generate? And the answer is that the corresponding map uh, gives rise to map of the UQ of G, again, injective to OQ of log GS. And uh, one a little uh, technical condition that, not, not the technical, you have to consider some kind of uh, uh, subspace of the space where this outer monodromy, we were talking about the previous lecture, is actually identity. So uh, 
uh, this outer monodromy, remember that we have for each boundary component, we have projection to this HP. And so I call it the outer monodromy. And so uh, we just equate it to one. OK? All right. Now, who are those generators? So, uh, so here, this EI is just uh, Q minus half uh, Q minus Q inverse EI. And this uh, FI is Q to one half to Q inverse minus Q, the usual FI. And KI is the usual KI. And so these are the usual uh, Greenfield Jimbo generators. OK, so this is the connection of the potential to the quantum group. So why we forced to such a rescaling? Uh, this is because uh, this implies that there exists a unique anti-involution mm, star from UQ of G to itself. Uh, for which all these new generators are, uh, are stable. If you don't do rescaling, that's of course will be violated. Okay, so now what is the key example of the situation? The most interesting example, uh, to the, the most interesting special case uh, where all these features are already present. Uh, the interesting, most interesting means the simplest one. The simplest one is when you have disk with two boundary points. It's a key example. So let's consider disk. And so it has two special points and a puncture. So this is the two special points. And so this is the puncture, P. And mm, in this case, we still have the additional data, which now uh, you draw as follows. So there are two decorated flags on the left and on the right here and here. And so we call them, if this is point S1, we call them A1 minus and A1 plus. And this is A2 minus and A2 plus. And they are related by, so there is a pinning. This means that the edge distance between them is 1. I'm sorry, and behind. So since we star and behind is equal to EI, the star is the identity on all the generators? On the generators, yes. Yes, yes. So, huh? I just put plus the star of Q is what? Also, uh, uh, oh, star of Q is Q inverse. Sorry. I didn't. I didn't hear the letter, probably. So you're asking about K. So uh, this is the standard uh, involution which uh, uh, offers the type which acts on cluster post on quantum cluster post on variety. And so in order to do something, you want to have self-adjoint operators. And just remind you that we have the generators plus quantum cell relations and plus kind of Cartan relation, which I'm not going to remind you, and I'm going to not, not going to use them. So in this case, uh, this data we were talking about before uh, spells out as follows. So we have this outer monodromy, uh, which is a map mu uh, from this modulus space Pg related. So I will use this kind of sign uh, for this picture to Cartan group. And this mu is given by the product of the projection to Cartan at one point. Uh, and uh, then you apply the standard involution on the Cartan to projection to the other point. That's what it is. And uh, now we wanted to cut out a little bit of the smallest spaces. Because uh, as we said, as you see from the left-hand side, part two, that the center of this cluster Poisson variety in this case will be Cartan at the puncture and Cartan from outer monodromy. 
And you will see why, but we don't want to have any kind of contribution from the outer monodromy, so we put it equal to 1. That's very important. And so we reserve a name for the moduli space we get. So it says that R reduced moduli space is just uh, uh, the, given by the conditions that outer monodromy is 1. And then just uh, to complete notations, we have this L moduli space, uh, which is uh, the one obtained from Rg by forgetting the flag at the puncture. So this may be look a little complicated, but what I'm saying is that we consider this basic model space, which is nothing else but I'm not talking about this, but what it means is that you consider in the RAM version model space of connections on CP1, which has one regular point and one irregular with this kind of uh, irregularity, uh, which corresponds to this picture, this kind of generic type of irregularity. And then uh, the model space of Stokes data is given by this model space. So we consider this model space. And so it's actually it was this key idea which we had uh, with Volodya Fogg uh, and long ago, before, very long ago, that the key idea was that uh, this, if we have correct moduli space, this one, then this is a quantum group. But to implement this, you need to have really correct definition of this model space, for example, to, to, to make sure that you know what's correspond on the boundary, because otherwise you get a wrong space. Now, how this idea implemented in the theorem, first of all, on the classical level. Uh, so uh, uh, again, whatever I'm talking about today is joint work with Ling Hui Shen, which has appeared in archive somewhere in April. And so the claim is that this model space L, G, O dot, is actually equals, coincides with G star, which is a Dreamfield uh, dual Poisson legal. And so I'm going to uh, dim give a proof of the theorem, which is actually construction of all the data, because that's where you see how it will work in the quantum situation. So I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the definition of LGO. Okay, so once again, uh, I'll say, so you have this model space, model space of Stokes data. The first thing you do, you notice, as I said, that it has too much of the center and you meet, you kill the outer center. Good. Then uh, its dimension, model space, will be exactly the dimension of the group G. It still has some data at the puncture, which was this flag at the puncture. And so you forget this data. So now you're talking about uh, pl plain moduli spaces of G local systems with spinnings uh, on, the, on the boundary sides. And the spinning satisfies the conditions that the outer monodromy is one. And so I claim that this is, this is the guy uh, to consider. And first of all, this guy is a group. So this is a group, and this is just a moduli space. And so the first thing you need to do, you need to define the product map. And the product map uh, mm, on this model space. And mm, so you do this by using uh, the gluing construction uh, map, which we talked about in the first lecture, plus uh, this kind of encircling. I'll tell you this in a second. So what do we do? So we draw a picture that we have these two disks with a puncture. And then we have the pinnings. So first of all, uh, if you just consider the product of these guys, then by, using, by, by doing the gluing map, uh, you ended up uh, on the disk with two punctures and two pinnings uh, remaining. because uh, you just glue. So the gluing map uh, allows you to glue the pinnings. 
the stupendous you glue them, they disappear, and you glue uniquely. Now, what is the point here? Uh, the point is that this map, of course, exists for, 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 for uh, if you don't put condition out to monodromy is one. But if you don't put this condition, then this map is going to be fibration. If you do put this condition, then this map is essentially isomorphism. At least it, it's finitely many difference from being finite cover, but on real positive points will be just isomorphism. And uh, after that, <coughs> you just encircle these two points. And so you go to this picture, where you have still two pinnings, and you have now one puncher. And so this is the product map. OK, that's number one. So uh, and this map is a Poisson map. So it's a product map, which is a Poisson map for the Poisson structure we consider. Uh, you can still note that uh, if you consider this mm, slightly bigger space, there's maybe a little bit too many notations, but just let me spell this correctly. So if you don't impose condition out of one, what you get is precisely B minus cross B plus. If you impose condition out of one, then you cut it down as you should to get the uh, dual post only group. Now, the next question is the unit. So what is the unit? And so this is, by definition, the trivial uh, G local system plus uh, standard pinning at both sides. Standard means one of the pinnings, but the same in both sides of the picture. So you draw it like that. And so. You have two pinnings here, but they're the same. Because the local system is trivial, so it makes sense to say that it's the same because you're kind of moving the spinning through its trivial local system, so you can do this. Otherwise, the puncher does not allow to do this. Then the inverse so the inverse is a rotation by 180 degrees. And very easy to see that this is indeed the inverse. And then the next one, what is the geometric R matrix? Again, I'm not talking about R matrices at all, but uh, the geometric R matrix is uh, the element of cluster, cluster modular uh, group, which does the following thing uh, that uh, you started. You now have to go on the product of these two spaces, which according uh, to the bottom line is just the same as you have these two punctures here. And then what you can do, you can just interchange these two punctures. If it's one and two, you get two and one just by this move this way and this move this way. So this is this geometric, uh, our matrix map. And so notice that I didn't, uh, so, so okay, that's it about the mm, model space uh, of this LG or dot. So you clearly see it's a group, and it's isomorphic as a Poisson group to G star. And so the conclusion of all this discussion mm, is that by geometry, plus uh, cluster Poisson geometry, cluster Poisson properties of everything you're talking about, cluster Poisson nature of our modular spaces, uh, PGS. So we get to the conclusion that if you take just this OQ of this LGS, that uh, gives uh, coordinate free a kind of new uh, way to think about a new geometric definition 
of quantum group. So once again, so when I say this, uh, I don't talk about EI, FI, KI. This is kind of uh, relating to the previous language uh, for the quantum group. You can just say that you consider this modular space. You don't really bother by all this EI, FI, the relations, whatever. You just take the, this algebra, and then this algebra immediately has all the properties. Because by the product map, you immediately see that this OQ of LG, sorry. is a Hopf algebra. This is immediate because the product map uh, is obtained, uh, is a cluster Poisson map, basically. Uh, so the gluing map, the most uh, interesting one, is a cluster Poisson. It preserves a cluster Poisson structure. And then there is a forgetful map. We just forget some of the data. And so it deforms O of G star. And so that's what it should, put, should be. And now, if you happen to uh, want it to relate to the classical language, then uh, you just notice that this Drinfeld Jimbo generators, they're given basically by potentials. Because uh, I emphasize again that on this modal space, you clearly see that there are some functions. You clearly see that there are pot these potentials, and the Cartan group there. And so they, they are naturally quantized, and so you get uh, the generators. But you may not want even to consider them if you want it. So then you get uh, just some algebra which has all the properties of the quantum group. So do you remember that the GLN, this theorem was also proved by Bolch? By who? Bolch, Philip Bolch. No, 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 no. Wait a second. So, so I, I'll. Uh, well, I would first of all say that this model space, I believe, wasn't considered. He did not consider that, but he considered a different one. OK, OK, OK. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, let me finish with a kind of punchline. We'll get. So this L space, is it, how close is it to the space of two pinnings modular action of the group G? I mean, you have a local system, so it gives you the local system is the main player. So there's also the. So the, the extra two pinnings give you just two cartons. It's a little bit. And the main body of the space is comes from the fact that it's a G-local system. These, yes, with this kind of additional two red points, the, the, you have flex in those points. It's lots of data. So the local system itself is, again, a carton, a carton model W. So this is a, uh, uh, the, the, the two flex, uh, which you see, they add, add you lots of dimensions here. And the final two cartons you see from uh, from the pinnings. So, so the main point in all this discussion is the following. So the main point is that uh, this part one, which tells you that these elements have canonical lifts. This is a very non-trivial statement. So uh, now let me comment on that. So what uh, part one means is that first of all, uh, uh, for each quiver C, which defines uh, the cluster Poisson data, uh, there exist some elements W, S, I, and uh, this rho S upper star of alpha I, which depend very much uh, on the choice of this quiver C. So they define specifically for the quiver C. And in this quiver C, they are Laurent polynomials. So they belong to OQ of the Storus TC. Secondly, uh, uh, mm, most importantly, that for any cluster. Where are the choices of the equivalent here? OK, so this boils down to the question. So the good question. So, so this theorem, this part one of the theorem, it uh, in a cryptic form contains a lot of very non-trivial information. And try to, to explain what this information is. So it says that there exist functions which belong to this OQ log GS. What does it mean? What is OQ of log GS? By definition, it's defined as follows. For every quiver, you have to consider. So what does it mean to define a function in, in uh, a quantum function log GS? This means that for every quiver, you have to define Laurent polynomial with coefficients of ZQ, Q inverse, and then <laughs> This part, part one. And then part B is that for any cluster Poisson uh, transformation, mm, 
which takes your uh, quiver C1 to C2, uh, you can define, you can see the following, that first of all, in this situation, you have WC1, just emphasizes dependence, and you have WC2, which depend on this S and I, and so they must go to each other under uh, uh, this uh, isomorphism. So you have the isomorphism between the fraction fields of OQ of TC1 and uh, fraction fields of OQ of TC2, okay? And so this isomorphism, so you have some element WC1 sitting here, WC2 sitting here, and they transform by this uh, isomorphism to, to, to each other. So you cannot just say that you have a Laurent polynomial one coordinate system, then it's good for nothing. Then also you do the same for this uh, cartons, so uh, they correspond to each other. And so only proving that you have such a, a package would mean that you constructed a lift. And as I say, it's a non-trivial, quite non-trivial theorem that the lift exists and that the lift exists and actually deforms the original functions. So the quiver had to do with the way S is cut? No, S, from the very beginning, uh, you see theorem given a special point S. So S is given to you. No, the surface. No. Oh, the surface S. So in this result, it has nothing to do with S. So S, the surface S in this setup could be anything, any surface. You just have any kind of surface here. Uh, and uh, whatever. And just happen to have one special point S. It doesn't matter what, what, what happens outside. That's also a point. Quiver. quiver. So I didn't talk about this lectures, how you define the cluster process structure. And so in cluster process structure, you define actually some infinite collection of quivers to start with, which are related by class transformations. And then they generate even bigger uh, collection of quivers, infinite collection of quivers. And so you have to start with a quiver which corresponds to the cluster Poisson algebra, cluster Poisson structure uh, uh, on this model space and all its descendants. And you're saying I shouldn't think of this qu quiver as cutting surface into... No, the, the, uh, I would say that yes, this uh, quiver can be obtained by a certain construction which is, takes about uh, half an hour at least to explain. So I'm not doing this right now, huh? I have you explained it before, no? I did not explain this before, yes. I explained this for, for SL2, but uh, not, not in any other setup. Yes. Uh, you, you have a construction of potential function for all quivers? Okay. Yes. So we have a, we have a constant for every quiver. So we take one quiver, uh, and then we lift the potential function a certain way. And then we prove that this lift uh, does not depend uh, on any choices. Because uh, when you try the whole problem of defining a lift, it's a uh, it's a problematic because you can consider like Q minus Q inverse to some element X. So when Q goes to one, it dies. And so you can always add something like that. And so when you say that you found a lift, it's not too much. So you have to find a lift, which is Z lift, which means that if you transform this lift by cluster transformations to all other coordinate system, you'll find a Z lift, which you supposed to assign to them in that coordinate system. So you find compatible system of these lifts. And so the construction, of course, the initial construction depends on a choice of many things, like triangulation of the surface, some data, which I'll talk about a little later on, the, uh, and, and so on and so far. And so you have to ensure that for some reason uh, it extends. In particular, you have to ensure that if you take your lift, uh, then uh, it will remain a Laurent polynomial after any cluster transformation. This is a very non-trivial condition because cluster transformations have denominators like one divided by x plus y, something like that. And these denominators seem to uh, destroy the, the Laurent polynomial nature of these elements. So the statement is that yes, you, you can lift in such a way that it's not get destroyed. Okay, so, so my question is, you, you take a, a group G on the surface S with a triangulation. No, 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 there's no triangulation. So originally there's a group G and a surface S. Right, okay, so then you get these quivers. Then uh, somehow I get quivers, I didn't discuss yet how. But you don't get all quivers this way? Uh, you don't get all quivers this way, you get a tiny part. So here's this all quivers. Okay. It's, okay. So, uh, uh, 
it is so canonical that that I mean it it is actually so th the main part of the proof is to show that this lift is unique in a sense that there exists always some system of coordinates where this lift is given by monomial and therefore it's unique because the monomial lifts unique way because it's supposed to be star invariant. So this uh, function W of course the lift elements which are star invariant and so the key point is that in some uh, in some situations it's going to be monomial so you don't have a choice. So, but then you have to prove that in all other situations uh, it's kind of compatible because you can have two different situations when you have no choice. And so why is they compatible by class transformations? That's, uh, that's a question. So the answer is yes? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, if you don't have this answer, then this would be completely meaningless because all these discrete groups I'm talking about, they all acting by cluster transformations. And if you don't know that you can do class transformation, preserve your things, then uh, it's, completely it, it's completely useless. So you cannot do a thing with this. Okay? So uh, once again, the, the key point is that you have a huge discrete group of symmetries. And you must preserve this discrete group of symmetries because otherwise it's not a reasonable object. All right? So now, uh, as I said, so this was our uh, kind of suggestion with Volodya, uh, but it was waiting till, mm, first of all, you need to construct cluster Poisson structures, that's what we did now, but for PGLM we did this before. And so uh, Alexander Shapiro, years ago and Gus Schroeder, uh, they actually find a lift, so they defined uh, kappa for PGLM using exactly these ideas, but there was no the spinnings and so on, so ju they just used one cluster coordinate system uh, using so-called special uh, cluster cluster coordinate system, uh, which we defined uh, by uh, Volodya Fock. And we when we define the class structure. So the, the difference between GLN and other groups is that for PGLM, uh, if you choose a triangulation, if you choose a triangle, there is a preferred cluster coordinate system, which has lots of symmetries which are absent in all other cases. OK, so now uh, as an application, so the main application of this is that you can quantize the whole story. And so uh, let's erase this. So uh, uh, why you can quantize? Because there is this machine of quant cluster quantization, which the first part of previous lecture was devoted. And you can just apply this machine in this particular case. Mm. Mm. So, mm, as an application, uh, we can define the principal series uh, star representation uh, of the quantum model double, which is, I remind you, this guy is uq of g uh, uq check uh, of g check. Now, why this works, of course, because uh, uh, actually we're talking about here, so what you really do, you, you, you construct, you, you do this for h, h for pg or dot, uh, which we uh, talked about before. And so here we know what to do because it has class, cluster Poisson variety structure with all the symmetries. And so we already have it. Then you, if you map one to the other, you get this uh, principal series. But uh, my point here is that uh, it's actually an interesting question. So what do we mean by uh, star representation of a quantum group which is infinite dimensional? Because if you look at the a classical representation theory, when we talk about finite dimensional representations, there are no questions, neither for usual group nor for, for quantum groups. But if you talk about infinite dimensional representation of the classical groups, like SL2R and so on, so uh, you really wanted to consider group representations, but not Lie algebra representations. Because if you consider Lie algebra representations, there are way too many of them, and they are not 
Uh, there are much, much, much more of them than the group representations, and you want to get only those Lie algebra representations which corresponds to group. And then there is a very non-trivial theorem which was developed over many years, which says that the adequate notion is the notion of Harishandra models. So you indeed consider representation of the Lie algebra, but you insist that when it's restricted to maximal compact subgroup, it actually uh, uh, comes from a presentation of a group, and the spectra is finite dimensional for the representation of this uh, maximal compact subgroup. So the theorem is that if you start with this representation uh, of, of, of a group, then you get Harishandra models. And actually, uh, this is basically the same thing, which is it's a very non trivial theorem due to many people. So the last proof is due to Bernstein and uh, Kurtz, like 204 or 14, I, I forgot. But it, it's, a not, it's, it's quite a non trivial statement. And it's a very kind of uh, very unclear that you can reduce uh, analysis to algebra. I mean, there are group representations to Lie algebra representations. Now you turn to the quantum groups, and then the situation is much worse, because quantum uh, maximal compact group is cannot be quantized. So there is no Harishandra models except for SL2. So this approach cannot work. Then you ask, OK, so if you just consider the representation of a quantum group as a map from, the, from this algebra to some space of functions, like our S space, OK, you got something, but that's not. Uh, uh, this is not the thing yet, because it's not the thing even for Lie algebra representations. And so the suggestion which we have here uh, is that actually, when you talk about this model spaces, it's not just a group, but you have many more structure given basically by this huge discrete group of, of uh, isomorphisms, uh, of discrete uh, automorphisms. And why you need it? Uh, for example, because if you have some quantum group representation, and let's suppose you change it in a certain reasonable way. For example, there is uh, the section of the braid group, which was uh, defined by uh, Jan and Lustig in 19, and around 1990s, which says that instead of talking about this EI FI generators, you can rotate this. So Jan was talking about this quantum veil group action, which kind of rotates them. And Lustig was talking just about uh, braid group action acting by automorphisms of the, uh, mm, of the quantum algebra. And so uh, if you construct any representation of this guy, you're supposed to manage to show that if you add uh, the uh, Lustig, let's say, braid group action, you get the same meaning equivalent representation. If you don't get it, then uh, this is not, the, this is not the, the, the good object to consider. And so uh, I'm going to show that, that this kind of approach, it gives you uh, all these properties. So it, it, this principal series representations comes with additional rigidity, uh, which in particular, uh, uh, proves the statement which I just mentioned. But let me recall the classical setup mm. that there is this uh, gelfand Neimark uh, principal series. And again, it's not just a bunch of representations. So the story works for K which is R or C or QP, it doesn't matter. And so the point is that if you take group G cross H, it acts on the principal affine space. And therefore, you can take the L2 of the principal affine space in your favorite field. And it's decomposed into integral of some representations. Let's call them R, which are parameterized by uh, uh, unitary characters. Uh, of h of your k. And uh, so there is some decomposition. So this alpha uh, is a unitary character. But it's more than that. So the number one statement is that you have this construction. Then the second statement is the construction of Gelfand, the Young Gelfand, Sergei Gelfand, and Grave. Uh, it's uh, 73, uh, which tells you, tells you that there exists unitary uh, equivalences uh, I sub W, which takes this principal series representation uh, at alpha to principal series representation of W alpha for any element of the Weyl group. Okay. And so, for example, if you take G to be SL2, then A is just 
uh, two-dimensional space minus the origin. And then this uh, intertwiner is basically Fourier transforms. It takes function of f of x1, x2 to integral of f of x1, x2, the character like exponent of 2 pi i in the classical NPRX situation, and x1, y2 minus x2, y1, dx1, dx2. So it's a Fourier transform, but shifted by using the symplectic structure, somehow twisted a little bit. So then the square is 1. And so, uh, and there is more, so you can consider uh, uh, like uh, principal affine space, take the all differential operators here, and then consider stabilizer by Cartan, and this is basically universal algebra of G, and so on so far. So the relation with the differential operators on principal affine space, which is the backbone later on localization, and so on so far. So uh, I claim that this picture gives you all this kind of package immediately and uh, without basically any extra work. Mm. So how this uh, construction goes, so I remind you that what I said that you have this AH of G and it embeds to AH of this modulo space. Uh, and then there is this triple of spaces, the Schwartz space, uh, Hilbert space, and the space of distributions. And all action is here. So this algebra, this algebra, and therefore that one, it acts on that space to get a star representation, as we discussed in the beginning. So you have this plus uh, Rigi define properties. So what are the, these properties? Mm, that first of all, just uh, as before that, first of all, if you consider, let me talk about Hilbert space. The Hilbert space related to this modular space uh, for the disk with puncture and two special points. So it is decomposed as integral of some representations, h lambda, d lambda, where lambda uh, belongs now to real positive points of the Cartan group. So please keep this in your mind. Oh, not all real points, but only real positive points. Secondly, uh, the Weyl group W acts by uh, cluster Poisson uh, transformations. Uh, and uh, Mm, commute with outer monodromy. It's a little technical, but I add this. Therefore, it acts on this restricted modular space, RGO dot. And therefore, uh, the main package plus this properties immediately implies that we have this unitary intertwiners. So what they do, so this is the analog of uh, Gelfand and Greif intertwiners. And so what they do, they provide maps, IW, from uh, this H lambda to H of W of lambda for every W in the well group. And so this shows that although uh, we get a sequence, a family of representation parameterized by the points of the positive points of the Cartan group, uh, they, those which lie on W orbits are equivalent. Not just they're equivalent, they're explicitly equivalent. The next thing is that you have this braid group uh, story. And I, I again stress here that the very fact that you have such intertwiners, it's a quite non-trivial statement, even uh, to understand, so it's, it's an intertwiner which checks on Hilbert space, but it commutes with everything. It commutes, it, it, it takes the, the Schwartz space to the Schwartz space, it takes the action of your algebra on the Schwartz space to, to, the, to, to the action of your algebra on the Schwartz space. I mean, it's, it's identical isomorphism, and they all commute. Okay, now the third story is this braid group action. Mm. 
Mm. So it's a theorem that Z map uh, we're talking about from UQ of G uh, to OQ of L G O dot, which is conjectural isomorphism, but uh, this is not known, and actually we, we don't really care about it at the moment uh, because the story is always lives here. So this map, uh, you see that here you have this braid group action, and here I refer to Lustig's uh, definition. Lustig's. And so if you take this braid root action, Mm, here, so on the other hand, here you have the action of the braid group BG. Uh, why? Because whenever, remind you that whenever we have a boundary component, uh, it's not on this list, but I just said this last lecture, whenever you have a boundary component, uh, you always have a braid group action on this boundary component if you have even number of special points. You have two, so you have the braid group action. And so the statement is that this braid group action maps precisely to our braid, braid group action. But now I, our braid group action lifts to unitary uh, intertwiners uh, because in our situation you have this group BG acting by unit transformations on this each of the spaces H lambda. Uh, and this action so let's call this action I sub beta for any beta for the braid group. So this action, when you apply by element of your algebra to some vector, you get a uh, uh, rotated element by the braid group action multiplied by I beta of S. So this intertwines the braid group action. The very fact that it leads to unitary intertwiners, again, it's a, a corollary of the fact that this BG action is cluster Poisson. Uh, which is quite a non-trivial statement on its own, especially when you're talking about the boundary. But as soon as you know it, so it's automatically quantized and automatically uh, gives you uh, this action. So, uh, and the last thing, and then I will make a break. Mm. So the last thing is that you have the center So you have the center of the universal enveloping algebra, uh, which embeds to the center of, of this OQ of P G O dot. And so here we have this raw, uh, the pre-image uh, from the puncher called mu. And so they, they, they basically match. So here you have to take double invariance of this action. So this, this uh, basically corresponds to that. So that's it for, for the first part of the lecture. So we'll continue after break, maybe start like in seven minutes at 3.40. And so uh, what I'm going to do now, so now I introduced this representation of the quantum group. They, by their geometry, they form something like a braided monoidal category just because uh, of the geometry involved. And I wanted to give two different uh, realizations of this tensor category, kind of uh, conjectural, but related to, 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 to different worlds. And so that will be the subject of the second part. So the next topic is uh, quantization uh, of moduli space uh, loc local systems, GS. Now notice that my surface S now uh, mm, looks this way, but so let's move it for now, the, the most general, but S T Q of T. So, mm, uh, remind you that we have this model space, uh, local systems, uh, where there's no condition as punctures, no action of W. The burial groups and bunches were forgotten. And so, <coughs> mm, uh, so what we had that this log gs model space 
it produces a quantized algebra OQ of log GS, uh, which is defined as OQ of PGS. That's where this model space PGS is really needed. And then taking WN invariance. So this is the definition, because there is no other way how to define the quantization of local space of model sy local systems, which has all the properties. You have to go up. You have to go to this bigger model space. Then uh, uh, we do the steps. So we consider the, quant uh, the uh, 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 modular double, Langlands modular double, as usual. So we take OQ, which we just defined on the left, and tensor this with OQ check of log G check S. So this is the algebra, uh, star algebra we're talking about. And uh, uh, we have mm, this gamma GS uh, uh, equivalent quantization. This gamma GS equivalent uh, cluster Poisson structure. And therefore, uh, on PGS, again, I stress here that all the work is done on this model space PGS, but in the end of the day, we are interested in the uh, smaller model space. And we also have uh, a quantization of this. And so all this put in together implies uh, the main statement. which were, uh, was the goal from the first lecture, theorem, that if uh, the Planck constant has absolute value 1 or is positive, then this uh, uh, Langlands modular double of the model space log GS uh, has a gamma GS equivariant uh, mm, uh, uh, equivariant the following equivariant star algebra structure secondly uh, it has a series of star representations mm, in uh, in the triple. So this triple is the spaces, the Schwartz space, Hilbert space, and the dual to Schwartz space. So we have representations. And as you remember from the first lecture, representation means that this algebra acts here, and therefore on the dual space, but it does not act here. And so the mapping, this gamma GS, it acts everywhere. And uh, this construction is equivariant. So these two actions uh, respect each other. And uh, there is a spectral decomposition. So the spectral de decomposition in general, you decompose this Hilbert space, AGS, as integral of some Hilbert space which depend on some lambda, and this lambda is element, uh, you take this torus, uh, which describes the center of this model space, and take it positive points, d lambda. And uh, this lambda actually belongs to this guy divided by w to n, because uh, different lambda which differ by the action of w, they give you equivalent representations, and so you need one to write down spectral decomposition. OK, so this is somehow the main statement. But then there are some related questions. So the question is, what are you going to do if you cut your surface in pieces? So the question is how to relate this H's for uh, different S. 
And here I mean the following. So you can take some space, some surface, beg your pardon, and you can cut it by a loop, gamma. And so you get one or two surfaces, depending what was your original surface. So So you get a new surface, and so if this one was S, this one will be called S prime. And so if your data, quantization data here, was parameterized by this lambda, the one I was talking about here, so here you have extra parameters, let's call chi minus and chi plus. And uh, actually, uh, if you cut it, you'll have condition that they are related, so you basically have one parameter. But this is the extra parameter of the center, so uh, you, have to, you have to understand that you have here lambda kappa inverse and kappa plus, and this belongs to uh, this original HGS real points multiplied by the product of two cartons at real points. And not just two cartons, but actually this is cartons divided by W here as well, because that's how, that's how this picture works. And so you need to relate this big, uh, bigger Hilbert space to this collection of smaller vector spaces. And that's what we, uh, uh, we had a conjecture a long time ago, uh, how they are related, uh, should be related, so we call this modular Funter conjecture. Mm. But in order to state this conjecture, you have to notice that we have this map, you have uh, a restriction map. You can restrict gamma is the loop. You can restrict your G-local system to, to the scattered surface. And so this way you get a map from PGS to PG uh, S prime. And therefore, you have the dual map uh, on the uh, level of algebras, which is a map from this H algebra related to the pair G and S to the algebra related to the pair G S prime and here G and S. So we have such a map of algebras. And so the conjecture, so this is an old conjecture, it's uh, Valodia Fock and myself, and this is uh, 2007. And so mm, it's, uh, kind of one of the key things you need to know is modular Funter conjecture. And says that the relation should be very natural, that this H, G, S, mm. uh, and lambda data, the original data of your, reduce, your irreducible uh, representation, is given by integral of the data related to this G, S prime, same lambda, but also the sky and chi inverse, d chi. And so the sky belongs to the positive points uh, of Cartan group divided by W. And this is not just, uh, so as stated, this is a statement about uh, Hilbert spaces, but it also has variant. Uh, you can look at the S spaces as well. And then, actually, uh, uh, that's where you actually formulate the statement, because this should be an isomorphism uh, over A, H, G, S prime models. I remind you that this algebra does not act here, so you have to have this decomposition, but then on the corresponding Schwarz spaces, uh, this algebra acts uh, here naturally and here through the, the restriction dual to the restriction map. And so it has to be compatible, of course. Okay, so that was the conjecture. So it's, uh, it is known in some cases. So why do you put chi inverse in this? What? Why do you put chi inverse in the notation? Uh, it depends. Because the, so it, it depends on the question, what do you mean by monodromy? Monodromy means element of the Cartan group. Uh, Cartan group means the semi-simple part of the monodromy, the actual monodromy. But monodromy is taken with respect to some element. And this element depends on the orientation of the surface. And the orientation is uh, uh, inverse. Uh, this loop has uh, one orientation on the left and one on the right. 
Okay, so the good news that this is known. Uh, so it's known for PG for PGL two, and actually before we were uh, doing this, so it's uh, by uh, York Teschner, and it's also recently proved for PGLM, like last year, uh, by the same Alexander Shapira and Gus Schroeder. But uh, for other groups, it, uh, it was uh, hard to state this. Another thing which I forgot to say, and I beg your pardon, so when I was talking about the main theorem about cluster Poisson structure, there was a works of uh, in Lea, a series of works, who established a cluster Poisson a structure on somewhat different model spaces. Uh, this was the previous one we considered, XGS, for classical G uh, and also for G2. Uh, so it's uh, lots of in interesting construction, but his constructions are case by case. And actually, uh, you need to do construction for simple lace group, but because then you can do folding. So it's the main thing is, is, is a group D, D series. Then you can get G2 and uh, B groups and A we already had, but still it's, it's, it's case by case, but he found some interesting particular cluster coordinate systems and then prove what needs to be proved. Okay, so we have lots of uh, mm, things here, but now let's go to, to the main point. So the point is that <coughs> We now relate this to this uh, Liouville Todes theory. So when you say to, that refers to works by Fagin and Ed Edward Frankel in 90s, like early 90s. <laughs> and so mm, uh, this works as follows. So we have two kind of pictures uh, of the story. So we have the RAM picture and beta picture. And so they're the same. So the RAM picture. This is a story related to Louisville Toda, but it starts as follows. So we have sigma, which is now a genus G Riemann surface, uh, with n punctures. And this is the first time in the lectures when we have surface with a, with, with a complex structure. So before it was completely topological. Now over this, uh, this uh, sigmas, they form the modular space MGN. And we need some bundle over this modular space. Let's call it LGN. And so this bundle, we can do it like C star to n plus one bundle. And so this bundle, uh, is first of all determinant bundle on the curve sigma given by determinant of uh, uh, first homology. So then it's a product of a bundles which you get from the puncture. So you have puncture pi and you can take the cotangent bundle to sigma at this point and when sigma varies you get another line bundle and each of them are punctured so here it's minus zero. So this is C star bundles, all of them. Now, when you look at this uh, C star uh, n plus one bundle, you say that you can take the fundamental group of this. And so this is uh, fundamental group of this bundle. And it, of course, fits to exact sequence. 
gamma s gamma s hat and gamma s. Uh, and so this is the variant of the mapping class group which you want to consider. Uh, you can also say in an equivalent way that uh, this uh, mm, guy uh, called LGN is a quotient of some kind of bigger variant of the Tachmiller space by the bigger variant of the mapping class group. So basically take universal cover of this and then this group acting there. Okay, so these are the notations, the, the first uh, round of notations. Now the second round is that I have to rely, yes? Did we put a hat on that gamma gamma S? Oh yes, of course, thank you. The second round of notation is that I need to invoke uh, W algebras. And I'm not going to talk about this simply since I don't have any time left for this topic, but I just need to say that they exist. So if you start with G hat, which is Katz Moody uh, Lie algebra, then uh, mm, uh, you can do the following: that you can define this W algebra uh, by something called Greenfield Sokolov reduction applied to this guy. It's also you can denote this something like that. It's semi-infinite. cohomology. And mm, the most important thing is that if you take the level uh, kappa representations of g hat, then you can move them by this ds construction to, mm, by taking actually semi infinite cohomology with respect to currents with an important group of this v in psi. I forgot about psi here. Once again, I do not explain anything here. I just say that there exists W algebras and kind of briefly indicate what, what is the words related to this. And so this goes to representations of WG. All right, so why, why do I need to say this? Uh, because mm, inside of this uh, WG, you have a Virasora algebra. And now you can ask a well-defined question. You can ask what happens with level kappa representations when you restrict them to Virasora. And then there is a mm, well-known formula which tells you that the central charge of Virasora uh, on this ds of v is given by the following formula, which is very important for whatever is going to happen. So C sub g equals rank of g multiplied by 1 plus dual Coxter number multiplied dual Coxter number plus 1 and set in Q square. Who is this Q square? So Q square is even more important guy. So Q square is H plus H inverse uh, plus 2. And the Q itself can be written using our beta, which we used all the time. It's beta plus beta inverse. And I assume here that the real part of beta is non-negative. Now, the condition uh, that uh, Q square is non-negative, this condition just means if you decipher this, that this h has absolute value 1 or h is non-negative. So, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the conditions which you used everywhere. And so in this language, it's transformed to the condition that this q square is a positive number. All right. Then one more piece of bookkeeping. When you talk about Katz-Moody algebras, you don't talk about kappa level, uh, you shift it by uh, dual Coxter number, and then this is actually our H. So this is a dictionary how you go between the world of katz -Moody literature and, and, and this setup. Now, uh, Fagin and Frankel, who defined W algebras in general, I mean, they were defined by physicists, by the Malochikov uh, in the mid of SL3, then for Solen, and so Fagin, Frankel, general case, 
give the mathematical definition, not these formulas. Mm. So they say that there is a something uh, which we can, we can call oscillatory uh, series of representations uh, v lambda of W algebra. And so uh, for Virasora, uh, you just take textbook by Victor Katz and Rain and Roskowska, uh, and in the one of the like chapter two, I believe, or three, you find the definition, uh, you, you'll find this representation written up for Virasora algebra. Now, who are the parameters? That's what's really important for me. So the parameters mm, it's uh, element of the dual cartan uh, and non-negative Q. Uh, mm, Okay, so uh, then these parameters alpha and q, mm, they allow you to produce lambda, which is uh, q times uh, rho for g plus i alpha. And so I am actually going to switch to this alpha, which is just plain uh, cartan. It's like shift in the usual representation theory by rho. Okay, and so then the statement is that this models v lambda is equivalent to v omega x on lambda, in where this action in the standard way, so it acts on alpha rather than on lambda, actually. Okay, so this is the data. So, so, so in, if you have complex Riemann surface, uh, you wanted to put to the puncher this oscillatory representations and take the covariance. Before I proceed there, let me just say once again, uh, what do you get for SL2? So if G is SL2, then uh, mm, uh, we have, uh, uh, we get this way as oscillator representations, Verma models uh, V one half Q plus I alpha. And uh, the central charge is going to be bigger than one and H is go H is the eigenvalue of the L0 is going to be uh, bigger or equal than C minus 21 over 4. And this is a very well known, again, if you take, for example, textbook of Victor Katz, you will see that the unitary representations are given uh, by some domain where this is C line and H line, and uh, they're all unitary. And we consider only some kind of wedge here. And we talk about little piece of uh, unitary representations here. H, 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 there is no H bar. So, so if, if you want to be confused, then you notice that you have H bar and H. If you're not yet confused, you notice that you have dual Coxter number, H check. Uh, if you still manage to guess through this, you have Lie algebra of the Cartan group, which is again H. And we can keep going. So, sorry, I, this is the standard notations. It's, it's H, it's not Planck constant. So then there's the RAM data. So this is the RAM data on tau GN hat. So we assign to uh, Riemann surface, V sponges P1 so on Pn, uh, covariance uh, of oscillatory representations V lambda K, 
sitting at the puncture PK. And uh, this means that we take the tensor product and then in the case of SL2 take coinvariance with respect to the uh, uh, Lie algebra uh, of vector fields which are meromorphic uh, and uh, uh, holomorphic everywhere except those punctures which they could be meromorphic. And so this coinvariance Mm, with respect to sigma, so it's a uh, vector bundle on MGN, and uh, the main player is this W algebra. And so inside of this guy, uh, we have a line uh, which depends on sigma and the data. Let me call the data here alpha. So alpha produces this lambdas, but I, I, alpha is just what we see here, alpha. And so this is just the product of highest wave vectors. So this is the highest weight lambda, highest weight line. Now, if you take this coinvariance, so coinvariance. For each Riemann surface, coinvariance give you uh, some infinite dimensional vector space. When this Riemann surface varies, you get some kind of bundle of, of vector spaces. And actually, you can argue that they should live on the extended modal space rather than the original modal space. And so, mm, uh, mm, what you get, you get. Uh, uh, infinite dimensional vector bundle with flat connection on, uh, you can say this MGN, uh, you can call it, we call it LG and star. It's a bundle over MGN. Okay, so we want to have a name of this. So we say this is V lambda one, tensor and so on, tensor V lambda n, W, G. Now, the key point is that this vector bundle has a flat connection, but this flat connection is, uh, so uh, you cannot integrate this over a finite moment of time. So it is flat, but uh, uh, one cannot produce uh, operator of parallel transport. Uh, for this connection. Uh, because uh, you try to integrate it and it goes to infinity. So that's a typical situation, actually a typical connection in infinite dimensional vector space uh, will be just like that. It exists only infinitesimal. Mm, okay. So mm, on the other hand, we have the data which we produced. So okay, so this was the RAM story. Uh, So we have this beta data. Uh, and this is data on this kind of extended tachymeter space, tau hat. So uh, this comes from this, uh, you know, all this uh, work. So from work with Volodya Fock and then with Shane. So it comes from quantization. Uh, of log gs. And I emphasize that all uh, kind of uh, recent uh, results is our work with Ling Hui Shen, so it's a recent thing. Uh, and uh, mm, so what it gives you, it gives you first of all uh, gamma s hat equivariant uh, local system. Uh, 
systems because you have this SGS and it sits inside of Hilbert space GS and sits about generalized function GS. And uh, as I was stressed many times, so you have gamma S equivariant uh, representation of this algebra AH of GS acting on S spaces. Okay, so now what are the parameters? That's the key point. So the parameters, the parameters are lambda, which, which sits in this uh, Cartan group, taking positive points of this Cartan group. That's where parameters of our presentation sits. Now, what are the parameters here? So here parameters. Uh, so you take some alpha k which sits in H of G hat. And now, now I want to, to, to move to, to the Langlands dual guy. So I wanted to put here check and put everywhere check. So we take Langlands dual uh, on the Durham side and the usual group on the usual side, which actually, as you'll see, is not that important because that story is Langlands cell dual. But in any case, so this produces parameters, which is lambda k, which is q, rho g hat plus this i LK, uh, alpha k. And so the first question is, uh, can you actually mm, relate them? Because this is, so it sits here, and the parameters here sits, sits there. So a priori they live in, live in the groups which are a little bit different because this is Lie algebra and this is a Cartan group. And you have, uh, this group is actually product of Cartan groups over the punctures. So roughly speaking, they're the same. But in order to say that they're really the same, you have to use identification. So you have to mm, identify the dual to G hat is canonically Cartan group of R plus. Uh, mm, and so why this is true? Because by the exponential, uh, map, this is actually Lie algebra of G, but then uh, the dual Lie algebra to G hat is tautologically the same as this. So that's how you get this main identification. So now after this, the parameters match. So the parameters of oscillatory representations are now exactly the same as parameters of our quantization if you consider the Langlands dual here and the original group G there. And uh, so now, <coughs> I can state a conjecture which relates them. So first of all, so what you wanted to say and what we, as you'll see, cannot say, we wanted to say that Durham equals Betty. We want to say that the space of coinvariance uh, on the Durham side equals to the space of uh, the quantization space we have uh, from our side. And we cannot say this because uh, uh, this actually cannot be true. Uh, so, because if you consider the space of coinvariance, it's kind of very discrete space. It has no topology, it has descending filtration and uh, you cannot say that you can hope to identify it with a Hilbert space or Schwarz space because they're topological spaces. They cannot be isomorphic. So what can you say? So the conjecture is that there exists a gamma S equivariant uh, pairing of vector spaces. vector bundles mm. with flat connections. Mm. On uh, tau Gn, uh, which is continuous Uh, 
uh, on the Schwarz space. So what is this pairing? So on one hand side, we have the space of coinvariance. And so this is something which we attach to G check. On the other hand, we have uh, the vector space we produced and which we kind of wanted first to be the same, but it's not quite the same. So it's supposed to be a pairing between the, this and the Schwarz space, two complex numbers. And so this pairing should be uh, continuous on S and uh, non-degenerate. So now how the data match? Because here we have some parameters uh, alpha. And here we have the parameter lambda. And of course, they, lam uh, they match as they're supposed to. Uh, uh, so, so lambda k is this q uh, rot g check plus i lambda alpha k here. So this lambda is from there. This alpha is from there. And they identify it using this isomorphism. And so, OK, so the statement in the version 1 uh, is that there exists a pairing between these two uh, uh, bundles with connection. I have to give you a comment here because this vector bundle has a connection which is highly non-integrable. I mean, you cannot have a parallel transport here. And it's just connection of MGN. So this connection is coming from representation of the mapping class group. And so it's by definition integrable. And it's basically a representation of the mapping class groups. So again, they're very different in nature. Uh, but uh, even before we go there, you can say that equivalently, Uh, you can say mm, that there exists a map of uh, gamma as hat equivariant bundles mm, with flat connections. It just dualizes in this picture. So if this we call uh, pairing C alpha and this we can call the same way, so C alpha. It's a map from the space of coinvariance. Mm. W G hat uh, to the dual to the Schwarz space, to the space of distributions. So here I use, of course, the fact that uh, this uh, pairing is supposed to be continuous here. And so tautologically, it defines this map. Uh, uh, so, but here it's an abstract vector space, no topology, so just a pairing. But on the other hand, here there's a vector, highest weight vector. And so it maps, therefore, somewhere. Uh, so it maps to some, uh, some kind of vector which lives here. And I say that this is. Uh, conformal block by definition of is this we define conformal block uh, for this total theory as the image of this map the image of highest weight vector okay so mm, now the key point is that this uh, uh, mm, that this way we can say that we just have a map from the Teich-Müller space to the space of distributions. Get a map uh, from this extended Teich-Müller space to the uh, space of distributions. Uh, and this map is gamma S equivalent. Now, the equivalence of this map really, really deserves a comment. Because if you think about this pairing, then uh, 
the left guy, this really sits on the model space MGN, or local, or, or bundle on this. So that's where the RAM story sits. And the beta story, it sits on the Teichmiller space. And so uh, this space uh, comes from non-integrable connection. And so this, the fact that this pairing uh, uh, compatible with connections gives you some infinitable condition on this map, uh, but, but not more. But the question is, okay, so how can we say uh, so that, that this map has monodromy uh, and this map looks like it doesn't have monodromy? So this is, this is a model space. If you take some point sigma, if you take a loop on the space MGN, then you come back, you get exactly the same space of coinvariance which you had originally. There is no, uh, we cannot talk about monodromy here, and so when you come back, you get the same vector space. And here, uh, it's supposed to be paired with something which lives in a bigger space, and so when we come back, we, uh, we live in the Dijkmiller space. And so, but it looks to me, it looks like if you come back by this loop, we come back to exactly the same uh, space of coinvariance on the left, and so on the right, if you have any kind of natural correspondence, uh, like natural pairing uh, between this, the, the DRAM and beta side, then on the DRAM side you get exactly the same guy you started from, so you, you must get the same guy you start from on the beta side. But I claim that you get not, thi not this guy, you get this on the beta side, you get the action of the uh, element of the uh, Teichmiller group which corresponds to this loop. This seems a contradiction. So how this actual contradiction resolves, this is, uh, so what happens is the following, that in order to define this map, so you have to take a surface and you have it triangulated. You have to put some data on the surface. Then this surface at the moment doesn't have any complex structure, it produces this vector space here. Then when you loop, move around this loop, so you, you of course take your triangulation with, with, with yourself, and so when you come back, you actually get a different triangulation on the same surface. So so it looks somehow different. Uh, so if this was triangulation tau, it was triangulation gal tau. The gal gamma corresponds to the loop, so it's a loop gamma here. But your construction, on the other hand, here you start with a space of coinvariance, and you get the same space of coinvariance when you come back. But the point is that the construction here was uh, producing uh, isomorphism or map to the vector space related to quantization of this guy, and after the move, it's quantization of this guy. This is a different, uh, this is a different and original data. And if you want to, to, to have two Hilbert spaces here, like H gamma, H tau, uh, and your cluster, and H uh, gamma of tau. And so these spaces are different, and actually uh, between them there is an intertwiner, I sub gamma, which we constructed in the way. And so naturally, when you come back, you come back to the vector which sits in this vector space. If you still wanted to, s to, 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 to observe it in this vector space, you have to apply this, uh, uh, this intertwiner. That's how you get the action of the mapping class group. And so, once again, I, I st stress that this is a kind of uh, interesting and kind of new, at least for me, mechanism how you get this. Uh, how you get, get away from the uh, vector bundle, infinite dimensional vector bundle with connection, which is flat but not integrable, but nevertheless you kind of catch its, it catch its monodromy on the right-hand side. You catch it because your construction depends on the data, and this data moves continuously. So it's a monodromy of the data defining the quantization. It's not a monodromy of anything else. And so the, mo the data has monodromy, and therefore your map is... Uh, twisted by that transformation. Okay. What? Uh, which properties does the... Which what? Which properties does it have, the, the map? Uh, it's, uh, it's a certain map and uh, it's gamma variant, but uh, it's uh, compatible with flat connections. So there's f the, the compatibility with flat connections give you some kind of constraint on the original pairing. That's all I can say about this map. Huh? It's not too much, yes, but at least uh, I can say where this map goes. I can at least one can state for SL3, for example, what is the space of conformal blocks. Because usually, if you take the, len the, the, the length of the conformal block, you get the correlation function. And so even three-point function for SL3 is not something which uh, was defined or believed by at least by some people to exist. Okay, so let me finish this story uh, with drawing some picture which relates all this and explaining it last, 
ingredients for just a few minutes. <coughs> so how the story looks like. So here we have coin variants. Uh, v lambda 1 tensor and so on tensor v lambda n uh, with respect to w g check. On the other hand, we have this uh, quantization uh, space. And remember, it's not a single space. It's rather Schwarz space uh, log gs, which sits inside of the Hilbert space of log gs. And also here, there's a space of distributions. And so what is conjectured number one is that these two spaces, not that they are e uh, equal, but they, there is a canonical pairing. All right. On the other hand, there is a third player here. Uh, because uh, by using this modular Funter conjecture, as I will explain in a second, uh, you can say that there is a third guy here, which is space of invariance uh, uh, of this modular double of quantum group uh, in tensor product of the principal series representations. of this modular dub. And so you can schematically write it down as it like this representations. And then you take here a h of g invariance. So this is the third guy. So since this is conjecturally uh, pairing, and for is in the case of SL2 or PGL2, There is a work of York Teschner and uh, some of its co-authors, which actually uh, gives you a good evidence uh, that such pairing should exist. It's uh, stated in different. He, he was doing uh, somewhat in a different language, but you can say that uh, his works is a good evidence that this picture is correct. But then there is a smaller Funter conjecture, which is known. Again, for PGL2, it's basically this set of works. And so we can go this way. And so you come out uh, with the idea that that's, that's supposed to be this link. And so this link is kind of reminiscent, like continuous analog of kajdan lustig Uh, from works from 1990s, uh, where you have uh, not representation of W algebra, but integral representations of Katz-Moody algebras. And here, uh, not infinite dimensional representation of quantum groups, but finite dimensional representation of quantum groups. But now, uh, this I explained. And so the only question which remains to be seen in the last moment is why this is the same thing. And I claim that this is clear, as usually, from the geometric uh, picture. The geometric picture tells you immediately this is true because how actually may I do it here? So here we kind of talking about something uh, which does not exist mathematically but could be called like uh, continuous uh, tensor monoidal uh, category with the objects given by the principal series of presentations. I emphasize that uh, every uh, moment you try to say that there is a tensor category with a continuous spectrum, so you're in trouble and you need to work 
hard not to explain to say what you do and you can't uh, you can't apply any technique which you know from this usual tensor category business so you should use this as analogy but that's a then the analogy is, is kind of complete so uh, and you don't think in, in in categories you think about homes in this case uh, for example first of all you never think about homes you think about space of invariance then you can develop such a formalism but still uh, you cannot use the main benefit of categories that like you take tensor product of two uh, objects you decompose this and so on so you have to you have to re rebuild your language but model of this it's a continuous analog okay and now how we actually defined tensor product on representations of quantum groups so we were using these pictures so we take this guy uh, with a puncher multiplied by this guy uh, with a puncher uh, with a with a pinning sorry I said puncher I mean pinning and this is a product and this is a puncher and so there are this kind of special points here and we considered uh, this uh, outer monodromy equal to E spaces and then this is essentially isomorphism and from this you see that the representation of these guys is going to form tensor category because now you can so if you just take representation of this and representation of this then the tensor product is by definition this H which relates to this guy and so on and so far and then you have a map uh, by encircling and so you have Hopf algebra structure so now you see uh, that you have a uh, kind of tensor product here and so on and so far why I'm saying this because uh, if you accept this uh, and it's done so so there is this kind of geometric way of thinking that's what I call quantum geometry of surfaces then calculation of something like invariance is a geometric procedure because all you need to know, you need to know this model of Hunter conjecture. And so that's, again, you don't need to use quantum groups. You just need to use, whenever you have any device which, has, which contains this, this model space, then you have such a category. It doesn't matter that it's related to quantum groups in this setup. You can for maybe imagine that you can imagine some different way to assign algebra of functions representation to this model space. It will have the same properties for formal reasons. And then you say, okay, you take tensor product. What is a tensor product? So this is the Hilbert space which sits here with two special points. But uh, then uh, what does it mean that you're encircling? This means that you're actually producing, so you're encircling means the following, that you're actually producing picture like that. And that's, that's how the picture looks like. That's what, that's what it means that you, uh, that, you, uh, that, you uh, that, that you had the surface, but then you can it just kind of identical thing, but then you can cut it here, and then you see that you have this space. This is a space of invariance, therefore, of triple product, because you take tensor product of two representations. Uh, I mean, it's, it's 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 very it's very easy to see from this picture the space of invariance. But that's exactly what our quantization picture. So here. Uh, the surfaces we're talking about, so there it's a uh, Riemann surfaces, but it's a Riemann surface related to uh, surfaces like that. Here it's topological surfaces, so it's like that. But then by this kind of, by, by modular Hunter conjecture as a main input and by this easy geometric thing, you see that this is the same as a space of, uh, of invariance. So I just explained the, the picture which shows this. And so this shows that if you have, if you have this modular functor conjecture, then this, this space indeed is a space of invariance. And then you say that, okay, that these two spaces uh, in a pairing, this means that these two spaces have canonical pairing and so on so far. So uh, all in all, in the end of the day, uh, you get the following picture. Uh, so, uh, so what you're really talking about there, you have this correlation function. 
in total theory. And physicists say that it's supposed to be given as integral of e to some action and some e to alpha phi 1, e to alpha n phi n, phi alpha n d phi, uh, which we don't know what it means, but it produces some correlation function, some function of the punctures, because you have this, your Riemann surface there with punctures p1 and so on, p2 and so on, pn. And there is a complex structure here. Now, now we have two sides. So we have the drum side, and we have the Betty side. And this is the two, the two guys. So on the drum side, you, you have the following structure. You have the space of coinvariance, wg hat, plus filtration. Why filtration? Because you have the highest weight vector here. And then you have all this tensor product of highest weight vectors. Then you have all the descendants. It's UV filtration. So you can think, mm, OK, this is a vector space with this filtration here. On the beta side, you have, again, a different vector space. And uh, so I can just call it H, but you can call it H beta now. And so this is like H Durham. And so now, the, the, when we say that there's a pairing, so you can interpret this. Imagine it as a, a comparison a isomorphism. So between H Durham and H Betty. Again, it's a little more subtle because it's not a Hilbert space here. This is not a Hilbert space either. It's a discrete space. Uh, they are not isomorphic, but they are in pairing, and there is no isomorphism uh, here whatsoever, just a pairing which is not degenerate. But it, but it looks like you're talking about the Raman materialization of some, some motif. And so then you have this filtration, which is like Hodge filtration. And so it all looks like an attempt to make sense of this integral, which doesn't make sense, in a kind of uh, Hodge theoretic way. And so it seems that this suggests that there should be some kind of chapter of algebraic geometry which talks about this infinite dimensional uh, quantum motifs. Quantum because we have a Planck constant everywhere. And this is an example. OK, so I did not have time to tell you how you define this cluster Poisson structure. I'm very sorry. It's about half an hour to tell you. It's not difficult at all, but it takes a little time. So you can find this in this chapter 5, I believe. Now paper is Lin Hui Shen. But uh, uh, other than that, so that's the picture which we have. And so I wanted to stop here. And thank you to those who survived for uh, surviving these lectures. <coughs> Yes. Question uh, about the first part of the lecture. You mentioned that you had a new geometric definition of quantum group. I mean, it's uh, uh, we just say that quantum group is OQ of uh, is is a quantum space of regular functions on this modular space which we call L G O dot. But not all quantum groups. That particular one. What do you mean? Oh, no, I'm talking about classical quantum group which corresponds to Dinkin diagram. Not a fine quantum group, not Youngian, not anything else. Yes, it's a, it's a classical quantum. It's a quantum group which corresponds finite quantum group which corresponds to finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra, which was the input G in in this talk. It, it just, the point was that you define usually quantum group, and you completely break your symmetry. You say that you have generators E i and F i, and then you go ahead you, you use serial relations, and basically what you're saying. You're saying that you, you quantize like your GLN, but in order to quantize GLN, the first thing you did, you choose a basis in the vector space. This is EIFI, is just equivalent to choosing a basis. And that's a little strange because you talk about symmetries, even quantum symmetries. So they would call it quantum groups, not quantum universal developmental algebras. So you want to have symmetries, and to define the symmetries, first of all, you break them. So that's a little strange situation. And so in this approach, the symmetry is never broken because you have this modal space in which you make no choices whatsoever. So it's a modal space related to this puncture disk with two special points on the boundary, some other data. There's no choices. 
then it turns out that due to spe specific nature of the space, uh, this canonical generator still sits there, but they are not maybe that canonical because there is still action of this braid group on the whole object, and it actually acts by permuting them. So uh, none is better than the others uh, from this sense. But uh, that's, uh, that's how the, 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 the standard approach to quantum group appears. But what I'm saying is that in a sense I don't uh, pay attention to this. So I'm saying that this, this space is a quantum group. And if you, want, if you want to do infinite dimensional story with a quantum group, so you look at the space, you work with the space, and you better not work with E, I, F, I, and K at all. And so all notions, okay, you have R matrix, you have some formulas, you have some universal matrix, so all very good. But in this approach, you don't need any of these formulas. Uh, you don't need any formulas uh, at all. You just need one input. You need to have a cluster Poisson structure on the space. And it has to be equivalent with respect to large uh, discrete group of symmetries. And so just that uh, and properties of the spaces, uh, like gluing map and the fact that it's cluster Poisson map, this kind of functorial construction, this uh, recovers all the properties which you need. Which you can try to recalculate, and, but I actually not that. Uh, I, I don't quite understand why it's, uh, why it's important now to calculate them. And the other thing, which is on one hand side, on the other hand, so if you look at this construction, so if you really want to get back to quantum group and using the degenerators EI, FI, then you need to introduce these potentials. Okay. Now, the very strange thing about this is these potentials were originally uh, invented and used in a different setup. And so, actually, this is something I forgot to say. Maybe I use one minute to say this. So, it's really important I forget to say this. So, there is this dual model spaces. There is a space which we considered in this lecture, PGS. And there is uh, another model space which we defined with Volodya Fock and I didn't consider in this lecture, AGS. And if you take the functions on this AGS, this is precisely upper, uh, this is where upper cluster algebra lives, defined by uh, Bernstein, Fermi, and Zelevinsky, upper cluster algebra, not cluster algebra, it's this, this guy. And so uh, then there was a conjecture, so when we define this cluster Poisson variety and this cluster Poisson variety, it's a dual space. Uh, dual in what sense? So it's, uh, uh, the main point is that there should be some duality, uh, which is kind of mirror duality mirror, like, for example, homological mirror symmetry and so on, which relates this and G check. Okay, so uh, that's, so, and I claim that we proved now that there is a cluster structure here and cluster Poisson structure here, and they indeed dual to each other. And before we get some uh, kind of quotient space, which is called XGS, and if surface has boundary, this is not a correct space because this dimension is strictly less than dimension of this AGS. And so this not even, it cannot be a candidate for the dual cluster Poisson space. The point is that whenever you have one, you have the dual the other, but they have at least to be the same dimension. Okay, if your surface has punctures, if you want to run this duality for, uh, I'm about to finish, so maybe put it here. Uh, so you have this PG, uh, PGS and AGS. But it's also very interesting model space when you consider these local systems, which you forget uh, about uh, the action of W at the punctures. Uh, so forget flags at punctures. Then here, this was our proposal with Link with Shen, that you should consider this guy with potential. And so this is supposed to be, again, homological mirror symmetry dual, duality, but this is treated as Landau-Ginsburg model. So this is same construction, exactly same construction, a different setup. So it is ex very interesting uh, question, so why is the same construction? appears twice in such a distant subjects as Landau-Ginsburg model homological mirror symmetry and construction of the quantum group. So there should be some, there should be something there and I, I don't know. Okay.
I have a philosophical question which has been confusing me since the beginning. When you when you can do these principal series representations, why do you always take a tensor product of two different playing uh, dual guys? Oh, because I, I'm forced I'm forced to do this. So I'm forced to do this. This is a very good uh, question. So I'm forced to do this by construction. So if I don't do this, it is still there. So it's a property of the construction, not something which you impose. So you start with this OQ of PGS. And it acts in some, let's say, Hilbert space, or there's Schwartz space. You construct some representation, OK? And then you, you consider take centralizers of this action. And the claim is that this is uh, OQ of log G hat S. So it's a uh, check. Huh? What? So, so if you have this construction here, you recover this guy. If you start with this construction, you're supposed to take different modular space, not PGS, but PG hat S. And this is a joint group, by the way. So it's supposed to be a joint. So yeah, you run a different construction, which produces a different space, but it turns out to be the same space. And the centralizer is the one you had before. So it's not that it's my desire to take this Langlands dual. So it just happened to be there. And this comes, uh, th this idea that it should be there, it comes from the, if you do quantization of cluster Poisson varieties, it's exactly the situation, but the dual cluster Poisson variety, Langlands dual cluster Poisson variety enters naturally to the construction. And then you just need to check that cluster dual Poisson variety structure is precisely the cluster Poisson variety structure which you have here. That's a kind of Lie group statement, but it's a part of the general setup. And in the situation where you have a quantum group, uh, is it some same, thing? same, some same thing? With the what's the classical analog of that? I don't know what the classical analog actually. Probably there's no classical analog. But so also I consider here the quantization when h is bigger than zero and absolute value of h is equal to one. In this case we have star. In this case we have star. What this star does is the usual star which takes star of xi equals xi. And this guy takes of generator xi uh, to yi, the generator on, on the dual guy. So if this list lives uh, here, then this lives there. So this star structure is not a star structure on OQ. So you do not get star algebra structure on the quantum group. It, it, it's simply not there. It's only on the modular double. And if you don't use it, then if you look at the formula, how you relate central charge to, to Planck constant, so this will give you a regime where c is between 1 and 25, and this is c like bigger than 25. They continuously go one to the other, but you don't want to miss this region. Because I said c is bigger than bigger or equal to 1, but there, there's two regions, and they're served by entirely different uh, constructions, so to speak. And one of those constructions does not exist on quantum group, for example. It exists only in the modular double. And actually was missing all the time through. Any more questions? I don't know. Yeah. Is, is there a difference in nature between h bar of modulus one or an h bar positive? Uh, what do you mean difference? I mean, do you see? No, they're, they're very parallel. So I wouldn't say they're the same. They're, they're different numbers. But so when, when we were talking about uh, last lecture quantizing uh, this intertwining operators, they are naturally live in the setup. So that's all I can say. That's not. Mm. I don't know. So, so for h bars modulus equals to 1, the q coming from this h bar has modulus just arbitrary? Right? Yeah, it's exponent of i pi uh, h. So um, and the star doesn't take, so the star here, we talked about the first lecture, but the star, this star, the, the computer star, it takes q to Q check. So it changes. The original one takes Q to, to Q check inverse. It was taking uh, Q, the, the real one takes Q to Q inverse. And this one takes Q to Q check inverse. But 
on the level of quantum torus, this is a very straightforward statement, but uh, it's, it's a nice fact that it's actually, you ca it, it's, they're glued together in cluster Poisson, right? You can glue them together, that's what I'm saying. It's a, a priori, it's unclear why you should be able to glue them, so you, you can glue them together, so the story. After that, the story goes. So the story, if you just consider one quantum torus, uh, uh, there's not that much, uh, I would say, intellectual value there. So you, the, the whole story, th this business is becomes interesting when you have uh, different cluster Poisson coordinate systems and when you consider intertwiners. This is kind of the main output. It's like the usual story, you want to go to numbers. That's how you get to numbers. If you just consider quantum torus algebra, you cannot get a single number out of this. <coughs> okay, there seems to be no more questions, so thank you again.